Hello and welcome to another episode of Attacking Third, a CBS Sports Soccer Podcast. I'm Sandra Herrera, lead NWSL writer for CBS Sports. Joined today, as always, by my colleague and co-host, Lisa Roman, NWSL analyst and broadcaster. On today's episode, we have a United States Women's National Team preview for you. The United States Women's National Team is going to face Australia in Australia. And that's a very exciting component. We're excited to get into the preview with everyone today. But first, a quick reminder to follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third. You can also head on over to our YouTube page and hit subscribe to never miss a new video, interview, or whenever we go live. Plus, you can all catch great extended NWSL highlights. Head on over to youtube.com slash attacking third. Lisa, how are you doing today? Sandra, I'm good. I'm excited to talk some U.S. Women's National Team because uh, we had a few matches in or earlier this year, and we weren't sure that we were going to get these in late November in Australia, there was a lot of question marks surrounding these two. Um, then they came up on the schedule, and we have a new roster that we we broke down right when it came out. Uh, we're going to run through it again for everyone because there are a lot of new faces, a lot of faces I am very excited to talk about, very excited to watch play uh, in a red, white, and blue kit. Um, I'm pumped about it, Sandra, but of course, I'm always just happy to see you and chat with you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. I, I told myself, you know what? It's always a good day when I get to see and hang out with Lisa. I feel like you and I often spend a lot of time together. And you know what? It's always good for the salts. Like, let's check in, do a little check in. How you doing? A little mental health and wellness check in. And then we dip into this and we start doing our thing. And, and uh, with the end of the NWSL season, like our, our hangouts, they're not going to get any smaller or no. frequently. It's going to stay the same. So everyone listening, our content will stay as, as prevalent as it is uh, and has been over the last few months and as much as it has been as hefty. We'll stay. I'm, I'm giggling about it because it's just kind of like, yes, it's like, we're just going to keep this train rolling. Like that's what, that's what we do here. And uh, of course, even though, yeah, we had the conclusion of NWSL for, for 2021, that just means that we're going to get to talk about United States Women's National Team uh, matches moving forward, at least for right now, this this particular episode of this during this uh, week. And, and that's actually a little bit of a transition because maybe we should start with the roster first, mm -hmm. Lisa, in this one, because we did just have that final match, the biggest match at the end of the year for NWSL, the NWSL championship where the Washington spirit came out, the victors over Chicago red stars two one, the first time champions, a new champion in the league. And right after that match, a number of players had to, you know, get ready to head on over to Australia and get ready for camps to, to participate in this, this international window and close out the calendar year. So, uh, let's take a look at uh, this this roster for everyone, just to remind everyone what the deal is uh, going into Australia. This was touted as one of the youngest rosters uh, heading over to uh, Australia for an international window and in really ever. And uh, that was really sort of the, the headlines around this one as people were getting excited for what could possibly uh, be the next era of this United States women's national team. So for, for goalkeepers, they're taking three over to Australia. It's Bella Bigsby from Portland Thorns, Jane Campbell, Houston Dash, and Casey Murphy out of North Carolina Courage. Uh, the defender list is Alana Cook, Oil Rain, Abby Dahl Kemper, now San Diego Wave FC, Serena Davidson, Chicago <laughs> Red Stars, Emily Fox, Racing Louisville FC, Sophia Huerta, OL Rain, Becky Sovereign, Portland Thorns, Emily Sonnet, Washington Spirit, and Imani Dorsey was added as a late addition to that defender core out of Gotham FC. The midfielder core is Lindsay Huran, Portland Thorns, Rose Lavelle, OL Rain, Katarina Macario, the lone representative of Europe from Olympic Lyon, Christy Mews, Houston Dash, Elsie Sanchez, Washington Spirit, and Andy Sullivan. Washington Spirit. And to round out the forward chords, Bethany Balser out of all rain, Ashley Hatch, Washington Spirit, Margaret Purse, Gotham FC, Sophia Smith, Portland Thorns, Lynn Williams, North Carolina Courage, and Morgan Weaver, Portland Thorns. So a ton, a ton of NWSL talent on this one, Lisa. It's a lot of players on this one with under 10 caps or less, even more players with no caps, you know, in, in this list. And uh, it really was a bit of excitement when the roster got dropped for these friendlies. And everyone was like, wow, like how, who's going to get the start? How's it going to look? What's it going to feel like? Um, and then also even having like that, that extra addition and Amani Dorsey, where it's just kind of like, oh, like you're, 
taking even more, right? So it's a, it's it's delightful to sort and, of see. And, and why would Vlako and Anofsky not take more? This is a prime example and a prime opportunity for Andonovsky and and the United States to kind of try out anything because these these two matches against Australia, frankly, they mean nothing. Um, it's really just a chance for Black Lananovsky to see which players fit well ahead of the January camp, because that that camp really means everything in the national team eyes. But this roster was uh, probably the craziest roster we've seen and crazy in the best way possible. We did break it all down. So you can find that episode on, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen, or it's on our YouTube page at youtube.com slash attacking third. And, and listen to that full breakdown. But as Sandra said, there's a lot of younger players on this. Only 10 players um, on this current roster traveled to Tokyo for the Olympics this summer and, and won bronze. Um, and the average age right now of this roster is 32 years old of 22 players. That's a lot of young talent, um, uh, two uncapped goalkeepers over six feet tall, which is fun fact and stat about this roster. But I think that this experience and or lack of experience and and young group is something that um is really black Andonovsky's doing because as a former coach in the nwsl Andonovsky understands how talented nwsl players are how tough the league is how competitive it is and seeing that so many of them made it to the playoffs and so many of them even made it to the championship between chicago and washington um, and then to get right on a plane and, and fly to Australia and do that. So he understands that side of the game for these players. And if you can push through a lot of adversity that was seen throughout the NWSL season, uh, you can most likely do that at the national level. And I think that's what he's looking to see and, and find those pieces of younger players that can play bigger than their age and more mature than their age with the, a soccer IQ. Um, and, and this is the biggest test for them, I, I believe, heading across overseas down under to Australia to play against big competition in the Matildas. Absolutely. Uh, you know, it's uh, it was good to sort of hear that I think out of his sort of uh, press conference, you know, post release of this roster, he alluded to all that mm -hmm. as such uh, saying that this is going to be an important time, an important window, not because the games necessarily mean something in terms of, oh, playing for qualifications of, of an international tournament. No, that's not what it is. But Australia is a, is a top ranked team. And this is an opportunity for a lot of this young core in place to potentially get some looks in a high level environment. And uh, going to Australia also gives the added factor of that traveling element and having to prepare and travel and put that on, you know, that type of, you know, pressure on your body in terms of, you know, putting yourself through that kind of regimen. So uh, I'm excited for this uh, young roster to sort of get some different looks. Uh, he didn't allude to some things tactically, but you never know. I guess we'll see when these when these matches come into play. And it will be two matches, Lisa. It's it's on the schedule for two friendlies that's going to take place. It's going to be the first time uh, that there's going to be a match at the very massive stadium in Australia and Sydney on Saturday, November the 27th. And that is going to be at 3 p.m. local time. But the, for the United States audience, that means that that game is coming right after what, Lisa? It's coming right after Thanksgiving. So if you're going to kick off your holidays, why not do it with the United States women's national team? Uh, that's going to take place on Friday, November 26th at 11 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, audiences can watch that on Fox sports too uh but it's an exciting time i mean it's sydney's you know a very popular place uh, it's, it's hosted a lot a number of uh, big sporting events uh, that stadium was specifically built for the 2000 summer olympic games and it's going to host a fifa women's world cup final in 2023 and the second match uh for the united states and australia will take place in newcastle at mcdonald jones stadium on uh, tuesday november 30th and that's going to be at 4:05 a.m eastern time on espn lisa so we're going from real late night all the way to real early morning it's uh when you saw that did it bring back any memories of when you and i had to <laughs> cover the olympics this summer oh for sure olympic flashbacks um with the caffeine and our hydration and waking <laughs> up at three in the morning to cover these games and then talk about them going live afterwards so many memories um and really some of the best memories let's be frank but it's 
it, these games are exciting. And this will be the first time for the United States traveling to Australia since the year 2000. So over 21 years ago. Um, and of course, it's a little precursor to the, the Women's World Cup that will be happening um, in Australia and New Zealand in 2023. And uh, as, as we remember during those Olympics this summer um, in Tokyo, waking up at 4 a.m., waking up at 7 a.m., uh, it's similar vibes also because of the times that these games are kicking off, but also the competition. The United States played Australia twice in the Tokyo Olympics this summer. The first time it was in the group stage and ended in a nil-nil draw. The second time it was in the bronze medal match. Uh, that that time the United States won. They brought home bronze to a score of four to three. Um, if, if, if anyone doesn't remember that, Megan Rapinoe had a brace. Carly Lloyd had a brace. Um, it was actually a pretty interesting match. Um, and, and I don't want to get too much into it because – the roster looks completely different. It's it's different vibes. There's nothing on the line for either of these teams heading into this. And it really doesn't mean that much. Uh, but I think it is important to kind of look at the difference between the two times they met this summer, 0-0 zero, zero, and then 4-3. And then uh, just remember that as you're watching these, these two matches that United States is about to play against the Matildas. Um, but uh, that 4-3 match uh, against Australia in the bronze medal game was the highest scoring medal match in men's or women's Olympic history, which is nuts that the United States was part of that. It started really quick. Megan Rapino, she had uh, the Olympio goal off of the corner kick. Um, and then Sam Kerr equalized uh, just uh, maybe 10 minutes or so later on that one. Uh, Megan Rapino had another one. It was it, the Olympics. If, people are forgetting there it was sloppy there was a lot of sloppy mistakes there was offsides goals from Alex Morgan that were called back in this match um missed clearances from both sides in the box causing goals for the other team one for Megan Rapino, one for for Sam Kerr on a mistake from Tierna Davidson trying to pass out of the back it was first first touches that were really off on both sides is committing fouls that were silly fouls that didn't need to happen really just not the best game for, for either of these teams. I'm going to be frank. And I, I want to forget that because these two matches that are about to come up will be very, very different. Yes, there are 10 players on the United States rosters that played and, and won bronze in Tokyo. But in that bronze medal match, there are only three starters that are still on the roster. Only three for the United States in Becky Sarbron, Lindsay Horan, and Tierna Davidson. The other ones are, are not on the roster anymore. So A.D. French, Crystal Dunn, uh, Sam Mewis, Kelly O'Hara, Julie Ertz, Carly Lloyd, Kristen Press, Megan Rapino. They will not be playing uh, against Australia. So it changes the entire look of really what this game is going to be. And we know that the United States, they played against South Korea and they won those matches. Um, and, and Australia just played against Brazil. Uh, the first match was a 3-1 win. For Australia, the second one was a 2-2 draw against Brazil. Um, and in that match, Australia went up by two goals. And then Brazil came back and, and tied it up at the end of things. So these teams are both in very different places than they were in July and August during the Olympics. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know what? I just, it just, these type of games between the Matildas and the United States Women's National Team, they always are a lot of fun <laughs> like I had, to, I had to put it that way because some of those matches that you were running through was like taking me back down memory lane and a lot of those were moments that they were like high level like intense moments but there's also a lot of those games that they just both of those teams just went out there and put on a bit of a show and that just there's I think it comes to that maybe perhaps that level of familiarity that is that exists a little bit between both these teams both Yes, having played each other at the international level a few times, uh, but also, you know, during an era of time in which there were a ton of Australians in the National Women's Soccer League uh, playing on club teams with their sort of United States Women's National Team counterparts. Right. Um, so the familiarity that that is there that exists, I think, also sort of. Um, adds another layer of interest and intrigue to, to these kind of matches, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, players like Sam Kerr, obviously, or, or mm -hmm. Caitlin Ford, who had spent a lot of time uh, in, in the United States. Uh, but, you know, players like Ellie Carpenter, who, who got her professional start in NWSL, like was touted as, as one of the youngest players ever at the time um, to be playing in NWSL. So I'm excited to sort of 
get to see those players in action again, you know, against the the uh, United States side. And uh, uh, it'll be interesting to sort of see the mentality that they're also bringing as well, because they're the hosts in this one, you know, and that sort of brings a little bit of a different energy to these type of matches where you're so we're sort of hearing how these games are perhaps going to look, feel, and uh, be a certain type of way for the United States and head coach Blanco Adonofsky as utilizing them as real opportunities in front of them. But if you're the host in this one in Australia, you're probably looking at them like, you want to win these. You want to win these games. And especially in perhaps that first match in particular, the one that is going to be taking place in Sydney, it's already generating so much excitement overseas they're like talking about breaking a record for attendance wow. in that stadium and ticket sales how they're just like a few thousand away from like a, a sellout only it's it's so impressive it, it is and i imagine that there will be a lot of fans because it is a rematch of an olympic match and and people they want to watch the americans play they also want to watch their own matildas play um even uh, australia versus brazil that those matches that happened late in october um there was a lot of people in attendance trying to cheer on these these teams and and see them in action once uh, once the olympics happen and it ends people are so hungry for their national team to play against. They want to go see them. Um, yeah, the attendance is going to be there for these teams. And and you're right. I think the United States has a bit of a target on their back because Australia is at home in front of a home crowd. They want to get these wins. It's This is like a pride thing as well for Australia going against the United States and, and the U.S. too. I mean, we talked about the roster and being a lot of uncapped players or under 10 cap players for the United States, these players are trying to prove themselves. So although in the minds of Vlako Andonovsky or even players like Becky Sauerbrunn, it's like, okay, let's see what we can do. And let's just play and see see what kind of formation we can do and different players in different positions. Um, if I'm a young player that has under 10 caps for the United States, and I know that January camp with Vlako Andonovsky is coming up, and then the World Cup in 23, I am putting everything out there on the field against Australia, because I want to prove my worth. I want to prove that I deserve to be called back time and time again. And if I don't start the first match, I'm I'm going to try to start the second match, which I think we'll see some uh, parity and starters throughout uh, these two games against Australia. Yeah, I'm in agreement uh, with you. I think in terms of uh, you and I sort of taking a look at this roster and then doing something like, a, oh, here's our starting 11 prediction. I think you and I in our content planning both kind of agreed, like there's so much, there's so many new faces here that it would be hard to perhaps maybe nail something like that down. So I think you and I both agree that we wanted to take a little bit of a different route, maybe a familiar route for some people who have been with us uh, listening to our show uh, for a while now, but maybe kind of like uh, the vibe of a wish list, like, oh, here's what we'd like to see, you know, like sort of get uh, time in this match. Um but maybe we can go through it together and we'll just sort of take it down line by line. And Lisa, you you know where I got to start. I mean, we're big fans of defense here. So we're going to start from the goal all the way to the front line. I mean, you. <laughs> you know, I got to come correct. It's it's three new goalkeepers. Well, not new, but two new goalkeepers and Jane Campbell with less than seven caps under her belt in this United States women's senior national team program. It's Bella Bixby, Jane Campbell, Casey Murphy, who are getting the looks in this training camp. Who would you like to see starting in goal for this one? Honestly, I would love to see Casey Murphy, but I, my gut instinct thinks that it'll be Jane Campbell as a player who has been on the roster. Um, uh, she got the call up for the Olympics, but didn't see a lot of time as she was the third string at this point. And now when you look at these three, it's it's almost like Jane Campbell has to be that first string. Um, and she deserves that as, as a goalkeeping position. You rarely get rotated around rarely. Um, so I think we'll see Jane Campbell start. I know Bella Bixby has gone through a lot uh, off the field with a, a lot of um, family heartbreak and things like that. So I, I'm not sure where she stands emotionally. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if maybe she didn't see time just to try to protect her, her mentally and, and things like that. But I foresee Jane Campbell getting a start and I would hope to see Casey Murphy. I don't know. We could even see 45. I was going to say, like, what if we see like a little bit of a split at some point, you know, I like, wouldn't I be wouldn't... surprised. I wouldn't be surprised by that either. And also wouldn't hate it, you know, get, no. get your, get your goalkeepers some looks, you know, uh, maybe 
put your money where your mouth is a little bit, talking about how this was going to be an important time for all of these players, that part of it was going to, you know, be a little bit of a hardcore evaluation in that, you know, the coaching staff is going to get a real look and see, you know, if players are going to rise up to this challenge. And if they don't, the coaching staff will find out very quickly whether or not, you know, these particular players are going to continue on in this next era of, uh, of national team uh, competition moving forward. But I- I'm with you. I think when it comes to the goalkeeping right here, you've got two, two of the goalkeepers who have, have zero caps under the belt. They're in these camps, obviously, for their very strong and impressive NWSL play. So I would love to see them get some time during – these friendlies if uh if they're both capable of that and have the space for that um but i really i look at jane campbell and her time with the national team and it's hard to believe she's someone who has been in these camps very frequently in and out but that seven caps under her belt is not a large number right and this is a position that is probably one of the bigger in terms of being under the spotlight constantly and we've seen Lack of rotation in this position for the United States women's national team for a long time since the inception of of this women's national team. You can go back in its history and literally point out the you know the the two to now maybe three main goalkeepers of this team over the last three decades. So when I see somebody like Jane Campbell with the seven camps and going into this ca- this camp right here, I really want to see her get another star, if not two, uh, during during this time. So in terms of the defenders, uh, let's take a look there. I think we've got a lot of familiar faces here, and uh, we're going to maybe just go, like, throw out four of them. I would, of course, like to see somebody like a Tierna Davidson out there getting some no more. No surprise, work. Sandra. You know, I think if you're going to still keep – uh, these young players in there, why not give Becky Sauer run out there, you know, and sort of have her sort of be that anchor for all these uh, these players who don't have a lot of time out there. Because next to next to Becky Sauer run, there's not a lot of caps under these defenders. Uh, you know, you've got Tierna Davison with the least amount of the center backs. So I would like to see her there. And you know what? I'm just going to be like, <laughs> throw a caution to the wind and say, I want to see Imani Dorsey on one side and I want to see Sophia Huerta on the other. I think put him out there, see what happens. I love that. I love that. I agree. You have to keep Becky out there. I mean, she's, we still got to get Becky Sauerbrunn a goal. Um, and I foresee that they're working on those set piece opportunity plays where it's centered around Becky Sauerbrunn and she's going to, she's going to notch a goal. Um, I hope so, at least. So, yeah, Becky Sauron deserves the start because center back is such a role that you you have to be able to gel and learn from the players around you. And having a Becky Sauron who has 197 caps, she can teach even players like Tierna Davidson, who who played throughout the Olympics alongside Sauron. Um, but it, it's a lot of learning and a lot of in, instructional organization that comes from those center backs. And, and you need Becky there to teach Amani Dorsey, Sophia Huerta, Emily Sonnet, even Emily Fox, how to kind of be that voice and that vocal leader in the back. So having Sauron in there is, is a must for me. Um, I, I love seeing Amani Dorsey on the outside there, even Huerta. I would love to see a Fox and a Huerta, um, two players that can really get forward and, and get into the attack and send those crosses in be that big attacking presence to get numbers up opportunities on the flanks. Uh, uh, players like that are so fun and good to see on the outside, but having a Becky Sauerbrunn in the center back can hold it down defensively. Um, I could even see like a, a Dal Camper getting a start here um, just based on everything that's happened. And, and now yeah. announcing that she's going to San Diego wave. Um, I, I think she has a little bit more confidence in her game yeah. and her swagger now knowing that Casey Stoney at San Diego is essentially building an entire club around Dal Camper. Um, yeah. But I, I see Sauerbrunn for sure. I'm in agreement with you on that. I think I think with the two games in mm-hmm. play, I think we're absolutely like along with possibly that goalkeeper position, we're probably going to see a little bit of rotation at the center mm-hmm. back position as well for sure. Uh, and obviously the outside back and full back positions in this one as well with with the uh, amount of candidates that are on on the roster there. In terms of the the middle third, um, it's a little bit of a mix, right? I think we're looking at the midfielder core that's invited into these camps, and you, it's got you've got six midfielders here, uh, and there are a few of them that have 
experience and have uh, been with the team for quite some time. So got World Cup wins <laughs> under their belt. Uh, and then there are players who are still sort of making their way through with uh, the national team and uh, other midfielders who uh, are, are new to, to the space. So I think for, for either of these games, I similar to the back line, I want to see a little bit of a mix. If we're going to see somebody like a Rose Lavelle on the pitch, I want to continue to see if a relationship and chemistry can be uh, grown and developed between her and somebody like a Katarina Macario. I would love to to continue to see that and see that moving forward. I would love to see somebody like Andy Sullivan continue to get looks at that defensive mid role uh, because so much of what was coming out post Olympics was, you know, how heavy of an emphasis there was on somebody like a Julie Ertz who has been still trying to rehabilitate post those Olympic games uh, from her, her knee injury. So I would love to continue to see uh, Andy Sullivan get some starts in these games as well. And I really do think with her 20 caps that this type of window, that is a player that Vlako Andonovsky is probably going to be taking a much closer mm -hmm. look at to keep in his midfield core moving forward. So I would definitely like to see her get some more looks uh, during these Australia games. How can you not keep an eye on, on Andy Sullivan? I mean, NWSL, she just won. She scored the penalty kick for Washington Spirit. She became an NWSL champion um, as a captain, one of the youngest captains in the league at, at 25 or 26 or so. Um, yes, I, I think that she needs to get the start. As as we kind of talked about with Becky Sauerbron in, in the back line, you need to have someone there that can play defensively. And, and when you look at this midfield core with Lindsay Horan, Rose Lavelle, Kat Macario, Christy Mewis, Ashley Sanchez, and Andy Sullivan, Andy Sullivan is the defensive player of, of this crew. Lindsay Horan has tried to play that role, and she can do it because she's talented, but she is much more effective higher up in the midfield. So I think it has to be Andy Sullivan, um, at least to kind of start and to kind of feel out how Rose and Kat can continue to play together and even throwing in, uh, an Ashley Sanchez in there, which I think will be really great to see because they both play together at, at Washington Spirit, Andy Sullivan and Ashley Sanchez. So I think that relationship there has already kind of started to grow between those two, which is really beneficial at this national team level. Um, but to see a, a Sanchez in there with a Christy Mewis and an Andy Sullivan, ooh, I think that could be really, really fun to see. Even Kat Macario, Sanchez, and Andy Sullivan in there. Um, I, I want to see that. But knowing the relationship between Sanchez and Sullivan already there from club play, it'll make the transition for Sanchez a little bit easier. But I, I foresee Sullivan in that sixth position. And then when and if she does get rotated out, which I'm sure she will, I bet Haran will slide in there, uh, which is – Honestly, just kind of a shame because Haran does so much better higher up the field when she has the ball and she can be attacking minded and, and creative. But hey, you have to deal with the players you're given and Julie Ertz is injured and, and this is kind of where we are right now. So um, any sixes in the NWSL, like keep playing great <laughs> because you never know. They might need you. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll see what comes out of, out of these two games for sure and what it looks like in January. But we've still got to take a look at the front line. Lisa, similar to the midfielders in this one, there are six forwards on the roster here that we ran through with Bethany Balser, Ashley Hatch, Margaret Purse, Sophia Smith, Lynn Williams, and Morgan Weaver. I'm looking at all of these forwards, and the first thing that pops into my head is that I'm excited. <laughs> I see all these names and I'm like, yes. And the first one that I'm rolling with is Margaret Purse, because despite Ooh. her time that she had with the national team in the lead up to the Olympics and then being left off of that roster, she actually only earned seven caps ahead of that big tournament. And the majority of them were all on the defensive back line at the outside back position. So I would absolutely like to see her get a look as a forward listed as a forward in the front line. And I wouldn't mind to maybe see her opposite side, somebody like a Lynn Williams or a Sophia Smith uh, and sort of see that trio and what they can do. And perhaps maybe see some, some substitutions come into play and have somebody like a balsa or a hatch mm -hmm. with them as well to sort of ha have that kind of uh, forward who can evenly dis distribute and sort of score from, from all areas. These are both two forwards and balsa and hatch who can score off their head, both their feet. And uh, I think it's an exciting time. So I definitely want to see a mix uh, at, at the trio for sure. 
we we know how few caps this roster has, but going from the midfield, which probably has the most caps uh, of, of this group and of this roster, then to the forwards, which most definitely has the least in Bethany Balser, zero caps, um, Morgan Weaver, zero caps, Sophia Smith, 10, Margaret per seven, um, very, very few, Ashley Hatch, two. Uh, yeah, I'm so excited about this. And and as you said, Margaret Purse being a forward, not a defender is is huge. And why would he put her there if he doesn't want to see her? So I foresee Purse getting a start, um, especially because she also has had a little bit of rest. Gotham being knocked out a bit early in the playoffs. Um, so she's had some time to rest. She's actually been uh, uh, flexing her analyst muscles on some CBS sports shows. But uh, now it's it's focusing and, and time to get into that attacking mindset for her with with the United States team, which is a bit of a different look for her. So I don't I don't know how fantastic she's going to do right off the bat I mean she will do great things but I think there will be moments of adjustment for her because she has played defender under Black and 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 I could even foresee formation shifts um uh, through this team and and maybe a three five two three whatever we could see I wouldn't be surprised if Black and uh, Black and Andonovsky switches up formation um but how much fun would it be to see margaret purse bethany balser uh, ashley hatch in, in the front line just speed and skill uh you also have to take a look at this group of forwards um and there's no one like a a carly lloyd or even an alex morgan to play that holding nine uh that center striker for this team. So those I think is, is really where he's going to be keyed in on. Could you put an Ashley Hatch there in, in the center of the strikers um, and, and be that holding forward to kind of keep her back to goal, play hold up ball, lay it off to the midfielders underneath of her. Um, could that be Lynn Williams? Uh, could you ask her to play that role? I think that's going to be the biggest thing that I'm looking at, uh, especially with this forward unit against a really good defensive team in Australia. Well, we'll see. We'll see how it shakes out. And I'm sure you and I will be texting each other and trying to figure out like, oh, like here's a player that we were really excited to see. It, it's two games and it's a, it's two windows of games uh, back to back. And uh, it's a quick turnaround. So they will likely to see some rotation uh, with the starts uh, for sure. And, I, and we're going to be keeping a close eye on it as sure as we can get. We do want to let our listeners know that these are not a window of games that we will be available for live recaps. We love ourselves and we are actually not going to do that to our brains and our bodies, uh, but we will be around with uh, recaps of the matches at, uh, at a more reasonable time. And uh, we want to thank you all as always for listening to us and our work here. Another quick reminder before we exit to follow us on Twitter at Attacking Third. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you listen to your podcast shows. Uh, if you leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts with a question, Lisa and I will answer as part of our mailbag segment. And we're also available as video. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Visit youtube.com slash Attacking Third. And we will be back Monday with more interviews and soccer coverage. For Sandra Herrera and Lisa Roman, this was Attacking Third.